Good morning, everyone, and welcome to your Daily Game Face. I'm Dr. Kim Lannon, here with... No, the glasses came off. Oh, you are just... <laughs> You're tired, sir, and don't start with me this morning. I, I... swear. Picking on me. I'm not picking on <sighs> Yeah, I took my glasses off so people didn't see me right off the bat with my glasses on trying to read, because <laughs> I'm blind as a bat when I read. You know this. Yes. So good morning, and I was going to say something nice about Lou Blasi, but it's just Lou Blasi, the producer. He's right there. He's picking yep. on me because I came in early because we have a special guest today. I didn't pick on you because you came in early. You were just everything was confusing to you because you haven't seen the setup of the show. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. Well, Calvin hasn't been introduced yet, but just as an aside, Calvin, do you hear him picking on me already? I mean, seriously. <laughs> you two have a very unique relationship. <laughs> Yeah. Amen. Uh, oh, no. So good morning, everyone. Anyway, it's a lovely day here in uh, near Boston, Massachusetts today. Nice and sunny. No snow. It's melting. Yes. Great weekend. I went looking for that. You you did the snowy owl again? Damn snowy owl again. And guess what? Nothing. <laughs> John actually saw one. It flew over his head. Oh, okay. He had no camera except for his phone and caught the back end of him. I almost sent you like three videos of snowy owls that popped up. <laughs> this weekend <laughs> so for everyone that doesn't know this lou lives literally on top of the snowy owls he doesn't invite me up to see them he just it, it tortures me with the fact that he has them right there and i go running and chasing them all weekend long and still don't find listen them. i've lived on the island three years i've seen one so <laughs> it's well, people, not like i have nothing i have nothing to brag about people were seeing them all this weekend all over the place yep it's just I didn't see them. John saw them, and other people we were with saw them. The closing rollout on, uh, was it CBS Good Morning? Yeah, well, that's what inspired yeah. us to go back up. That's uh, yeah. We ran up right after we saw the end of CBS uh, Morning on Sunday. It was Plum Island, and the little snowy owl had popped up, and I knew exactly where they filmed it, and we ran right there, and nothing. What the hell is CBS got going on? They have a crew out on Plum Island when, <laughs> when houses aren't falling into the ocean. That's the only time we normally see them. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Yeah. So now we're here for bigger and better things because yeah. today we've been waiting for weeks for Calvin Evans, who is joining us here. And if you are watching, you can see his lovely face on screen. He's joining us from Colorado this morning. It's very early there. You know, we've been up for hours. He's probably been up for a short time. He probably got up and worked out this morning and did his thing. But Calvin Evans has come to be known to me because of the Human Baton. Yes. And the Human Baton is the race series adventure um, experience um, franchise uh, that we are involved in. And Calvin is our Human Baton in training. And so um, let me give you a little bit of background on that first, is that for people that haven't heard me talk about this before, the Human Baton is a multiple race sport franchise that has uh, Thundercat racing boats, long distance endurance horses, uh, UTV desert cars, drift cars, rally cars, jumping out of planes. Um, we were talking about rock crawlers a month ago when we were in Texas. Yeah. And I, I've only ever seen those on TV, but that's kind of interesting. But um, so it's a special kind of person to become a human baton and to be in training. And Calvin happens to be one of these spectacular, special kind of people. So Calvin and I met um, about a month ago, um, but he's been known to the Human Baton for a while because he's wanted to be part of us and our family, and so we have welcomed him with open arms, and he's doing a fantastic job. But he's here today not just to talk about the Human Baton, but mainly he is, but also to talk about um, he's got a great interest in, in similar things that I do with my clientele and my patients in that he's a wellness and fitness expert. Um, he uh, loves adventure. He puts out there in the world great energy to get people into their best selves. So Calvin nice. has tons of great stuff to talk about, about how to inspire um, yourself when you're you know, Calvin, if you've seen the show, which I think you have, I often try to get people that are not in the most motivated spaces to get motivated um, and then kind of go forward. That you don't have to be an elite athlete or a human baton to just be your best self. You just have to take a first step. So, um, so w with no further ado, welcome Calvin Evans. It is an honor to be on the show. Thank you so much for that glowing 
glowing introduction. <laughs> I appreciate that so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much. It is great to be on this morning. Good, excellent. I just so, want this guy's voice. That's all. You, That's you, all I want. I just want the voice. <laughs> <clears throat> Lou wants your voice, Calvin. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. I appreciate that. I've done a little bit of radio here and there, so I like this. Nice. So, Calvin. Could... See, I, automatically I went down to the lower voice. He's, right. yeah. he's, he's matching you. <laughs> <laughs> and he even dropped his chin, too. He's like, yes. nice. <laughs> I, <did. laughs> I love it. Um, wait, I'll talk like that, too. We can all talk like that. <laughs> Very sexy and smoky. <laughs> okay, stop. All right, we'll never get through the show if we keep doing this. All right, so, Calvin. Calvin, um, tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of your health and fitness, your adventurousness. One of the things I'd love for you to touch on a little bit is how you're inspired by Jacques Cousteau. And we'll start there. That sounds great. So uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and uh, uh, I'm the oldest of three brothers. And uh, uh, my household was about adventure for me growing up. Uh, because I loved watching television. And one of my favorite heroes on television was watching Jacques Cousteau. And uh, I loved the fact that he had such a passion to uh, not only have adventure, to explore the ocean, but he had a way of trying to draw people in to join him in that and to become uh, encouraged to be a part of the so the solution, not the problem, because he was really big on taking care of our oceans, making sure they were clean. Uh, and he just had this way about him, this charisma that said, yeah, I want to join you in, in, in doing this. Uh, and so that stuck with me growing up. And then I would watch Marlon Perkins, uh, um, Mucho Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And I'd love to want to be like Jim out there wrestling with the anacondas and stuff like that. <laughs> and then uh, he had I, snowy uh, owls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. So my, with my overactive imagination, that is what uh, stuck with me. It stuck with me so much that at the age of four years, of, uh, four years old, uh, my second brother, he is four years younger than me. He came early because of my stunts. Uh, my mom was pregnant, six months pregnant at the time. And we were watching Jacques Cousteau. And for my overactive imagination, I would try and imagine a world of underwater wonder by going up underneath the bed and acting like I was swimming. And then my head got stuck underneath the frame. And so my mom had to actually lift the bed up off my big head and her water broke. And so that's how my, my brother was born because of me <laughs> acting like I was swimming uh, underneath the bed. So if that tells you what type of imagination that I had and how much fun I had and sometimes got in trouble, that is like my life right there. <laughs> if I could figure out a way to get into some sort of trouble, it would be because of my overactive imagination and adventure. So, so that so that was something. That's amazing because a lot of kids, you know, have similar stories and then they get channeled either into doing things that are adventurous or they kind of get squelched and told like, all right, we're going to calm you down. Right. So, right. so given that, you know, you, you do work with youth and you do work with a lot of different programs and, and that story a little bit there, and I, I digress, but sort of not that how do you, or how did your mom, um, for all the parents out there listening, how did your mom foster that energy for you besides having her water break and having a baby? <laughs> well, what was it's interesting is that my, my dad at the time uh, instilled in me a sense of self to be proud of who I am and my name. My mother shared her care and nurture uh, for to foster um, me as who I am as a person and my adventurous self. And so because of that encouragement, um, it gave me uh, hope, it gave me safety, it gave me something to be able to press forward in and experiencing that and growing, uh, growing up with an overactive imagination. So I was always outside. I loved uh, going outside, uh, building forts, playing out in the woods, just anything that I could do to get outside and then come back when the, uh, the street lights came on because of course you wanted to come in before dark you wanted to make sure that you didn't miss dinner and you wanted to make sure that you not only had a great time but had stories out there as well so for me uh, i didn't start getting into fitness and wellness not until about oh my sophomore junior year of high school 
And so fitness was like that added extra um, icing on the cake for me because then I, I became stronger. I noticed that I could, uh, my sport at that time was basketball. I was five foot nothing, but yet I kept exercising. And then I started working on ways that I could dunk and rebound and do all types of stuff. So that was another extra added element. And then of all the things, we had career day in my uh, senior year of high school and we had the military come in. So we had the Marine Corps, the Army and the Air Force. Uh, the Army guy tried to buy me sandwiches so that way I could join him. And my mom was like, she wasn't having it because my dad was in the Army and she didn't like that too much. And then the Marine Corps guy was trying to get me to join and my cousins were like, no, you don't want to do that because they were in the Marine Corps and they're like a couple of years older than me. And so that left the Air Force guy. And the Air Force guy, he was nice. He said, well, here's the deal, Calvin. Let's see what you're good at. Are you good at languages? I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a test. So it's like, yeah, we'll take, give you a test on languages. So I wound up doing really well on that. And then he wound up getting me a job before I turned 18 as a Russian cryptological linguist. So he sent me into Intel. Uh, and so- Jacques Cousteau uh, to Russian linguist. Look at that, Lou. Nice. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Fascinating story. So uh, when I get to basic training, I'm all excited, trying to figure out what life is going to be like. And that was where I had to learn how to channel my adventurous self, because it's not always a good idea to have an overactive imagination when you're in boot camp. The, <laughs> the training instructors don't like that too much. So I had to channel it, make sure that I kept it under wraps for a little bit. And then I was sent off to sunny Monterey, California. Never been to California in my life. I step off the plane. I thought I was in Disneyland. First of all, <laughs> I didn't see any trash on the ground. I was trying to figure out where am I? This is amazing. And this was 1990. So it was a huge uh, step for me from leaving Houston, Texas and going to Monterey, California. So I spent a year there uh, learning Russian. And then uh, I went to tech school back in Texas, in San Angelo, Texas, to learn my other side of the job where I had to get uh, uh my background check, my top security clearance, top secret security clearance, uh, and learn the ins and outs of the military aspect of my job. And then my favorite part was I went to survival school in Spokane, Washington, SEER training. So that was where the rubber meets the road, where you have to learn how to deal with POW training, interrogations, how to survive in the woods in case you're um, were in, behind enemy lines, how do you survive in the water, uh, if you uh, wind up crashing in the water, it was one of the most um, exciting and challenging things I've ever been through in my life. That was like the epitome of adventure for me, learning the skills to survive in the event that I'm behind enemy lines and how do I get back home? Uh, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about mindset. I learned a lot and that set up my life up until this point. Okay, so, okay, wow. So this is this is great because this is exactly what you know, parents and kids that listen, and there are a lot that do listen to the show, you know, are thinking about, okay, how, how, you know, I can relate to a lot of that. I have an active imagination. I have adventurous mind. Oh, by the way, we're in a pandemic. How am I going to do that <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> right now? Um, you know, and then being like, oh, Russian and, and, and I know also know that you're a Chinese linguist as well. So all these different pieces. And then, and there you end up in, in a, um, a great position to kind of move your life forward um, and provide more of your own opportunities. So, <clears throat> you know, speaking of, of, you know, inspiring, you know, what, what kept you going in that direction? You know, just for like the young listeners, what kept you going so that you didn't say, ah, I give up. Cause that's such a, a common thing that I see now is, you know, kids, people in general kind of go, ah, it's too much work. It's too, you know, it's too difficult. Like, so what kept you going? I'm going to, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that were very pivotal, pivotal in my life that helped to keep me going. Number one, were the type of people that I surrounded myself with that makes a difference more than anything else yes. is the company that you keep. Yep. You have individuals that are around you that are supporting you and want you to pursue your dreams and to be able to reach your dreams. That's great. If you have Debbie Downers, sorry to say, or people that aren't uh, as motivated in terms of wanting to have their lives change and they're constantly looking at the negativity of the world and the negative things that happen and they want to continue to keep dragging down. But to me, those are kind of like 
uh, fun suckers. They just keep taking things from you left and right. Just I call uh, them the soul suckers in my field. Suckers. That, like if I'm talking to a patient and they have people in their lives like that, I say it's because they're soul sucking from you. They're taking your energy. They're taking your, your spirit from you that you really want to move forward because they'll hold you down. Exactly. And, and so I, I was able to learn at an early age, those people that cared enough for me to be able to pour uh, encouragement toward me, to be able to help foster this uh, passion that I have, to keep saying, Calvin, whatever your dream is, keep pursuing that. That was very, very important and very formative while I was in the military because there were certain individuals that did that. And I have to share of, a, of an interesting moment in my life where I uh, was given an opportunity for this amazing uh, option when I was in uh, uh, Monterey, California, learning my language. Uh, as an Air Force member on an Army post, we have uh, morning uh, morning reveille. We, we come together as a squadron. We have to form up, and we have certain duties that we're supposed to assign. Uh, my leader at that time uh, went to Airmen of the Board. And Airmen of the Board is when you go before uh, a group of peers and leaders to be able to test you on your knowledge as far as the military and things like that, and your bearing and how you look in your uniform. And if you have the ability to be able to portray yourself as a squared away uh, airman. And uh, he had asked me if I would mind taking his place because he was busy having to do something. And I, I answered him and said, I don't think I can do that. I don't, I don't know anything about how to prepare for that kind of thing. I don't know if I'll do well. Uh, no, that's okay. Why don't you find somebody else? And the look that he gave me of pure like, I can't believe you just gave this up. Why, why would you give that up? It was like shameful. I just felt like terrible that I had someone that believed in me so much and I didn't believe in myself. And that stuck with me. And it stuck with me to the point that challenged me that said, if ever I'm given an opportunity, I won't uh, sabotage myself to see if I'm available for it. I'm going to give it my all. And that way uh, it won't be because I gave up. It was because I gave it my all if I didn't make it. And that was a very pivotal um uh, scenario that happened in my life that's propelled me to where I am today, uh, to where different opportunities that I'll be able to share later on in our program that I said, yes, I want to go and do that. I, I, I did not ever want to be caught again with that look of having someone that said, I believe in you, Calvin, but you don't believe in yourself enough to be able to go after something. So the disappointment, that feeling of you disappointed him and the, the expectation that you were dashing an expectation that you knew he believed in you, that he had in you, and there it was right in front of you and you were saying no, essentially, right? right? So it's, yeah. it's really, so if I could clarify it just for like the summary of telling the audience is it's really about saying yes. You yes. know, say yes, even if it's a fail, say yes, because you'd rather have the option to do that. And as you know, and Calvin, you and I've talked about this, is that failure, um, people are so afraid to fail, so they don't take the shot, essentially. They don't take the leap. They don't say yes over and over again, because it's safer to, to not. But then it leads to all that resentment, regret, sadness over time. But what a great um, story, because I, I see people all the time that have a story like, oh, someone gave me this opportunity and I didn't take it. And now I have regret down the line. And mm -hmm. Lou. I want to go back to yeah. you two talking about soul sucking and joy sucking. <laughs> because the thing, that, the thing that impressed me most about your answer, Calvin, there was, um, and I think the point here is that all that joy sucking and soul sucking often comes most from internally as opposed to externally and surrounding yourself. Calvin's sitting there, he gets to the point in the story where he's going to survival training, and he's talking about POW training, interrogation training, water crash training, water survival, and he's smiling, and he's calling it exciting and challenging, where before he finished the sentence, I'm thinking, torturous. That's what, that's what I'm thinking the adjective is that's going to come out. So just the way he approached that makes it an entirely different experience, and I think that's a great life lesson. Yeah, it's that mindset that yeah. we always talk about is you have a choice in the mindset that you have. And it could have been the one that, you know, Calvin has, which is the yeah. one I I loved for. interrogation training. I loved POW amazing. training. It's exciting. Yeah. I exciting. Yeah. I want to be tortured. Yeah, yes, exactly. it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but I think that <laughs> Calvin's laughing. Um, I think that that speaks to so many people, though, that have that fear of yeah. not taking that that mindset and be, you know, maybe it's internal to them to want to feel that way, but the fear is in the way that 
but if I do that, it's not working out or if it's going to, it's not going to go well for me. So I sabotage myself and that it is the internal um, space and it's very difficult to well, push through that. Threat generating, which I'm a king of because I'm thinking about what he's talking about and I'm thinking how awful that would be. And he's going into it and came out of it thinking exciting and challenging. And, and well, yes. And, and I, I don't think, and Calvin, you, you and I talked about this a little bit and you could speak to this is when you have um, that mindset, you often have little moments of, of oh, doubt, but that's not what sits with you, I would imagine. It's the override button that you push that it's an adventure. It means you, you flip it in your head to mean something that could be creating another opportunity. So instead of it being a threat, it's an opportunity. So right. that's what makes it exciting, I would imagine. So what's it's it, interesting about that, Dr. Kim, is that it, there is a perspective that has to be fostered in that. Is it, it's not something that we are um, immediately going to jump to, that it's going to be a great experience, because it was one of the toughest things I've ever had to deal with and face. And what was great about it was the character that was built from that process, the strength and the ability to know that I overcame something that not too many people have the ability to go through or even face at times. And it helped to foster more growth and say, it's okay to fail. It's okay to learn. It's okay to be able to uh, extend myself out and go into something that's uncomfortable where it, I'm uh, having to stay up all night in the hole. Uh, and that's a whole nother experience or uh, psychological warfare of someone trying to break me down. How am I able to deal with that situation or how are, am I going to be out in the woods where I've never camped a day in my life? And now that you want me to spend a week out in the woods with a partner to be able to survive and evade and stuff like that. It was, it was a wonderful experience because I had the opportunity to do something new and the adventure portion, just that overrode uh, the concerns. Uh, and I believe that I it was given the tools enough to be able to take care of myself and take care of those around me. That was a great accomplishment in and of itself. See, now we all need a Calvin in our lives, don't we? <laughs> we like, need to be Calvin. <laughs> we all need to be Calvin or have a Calvin in our lives. Yeah. It's, it's because any, the genuineness and the authenticity of that. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Even with Calvin here, yeah. I'm not signing up for POW training. But, <laughs> <laughs> but by the same token, if I had that attitude going in, things would be a lot better. But, okay, so this is the point of my show always, is yeah. that we're trying to encourage, and I'm trying to get people to be more like Calvin. That's going to be my new slogan, be more like be Calvin. Like Calvin yeah. I like it. <laughs> um, okay, so Calvin, so this is great, but I want to get, I, and there's so many pieces, and you know how this happens, Lou, is I get people on, and I'm like, we should schedule three times to have them yeah. on, right? But, okay, so Calvin's got all this great stuff, but he's got this great story that I think makes him a great human baton that has prior life on TV is that oh. he did this very, uh, it would scare me because the story of what he ended up doing to end up in this position he was in, he did um, a show called One Man Army. No. Oh. And, and he has quite the story about that. And it's also that inspiring thing. In particular, Calvin, if you could talk a little bit to our audience about um, saving in the same frame of like, you know, overcoming fear and all the resiliency pieces, but you know, you being the story you told me about and being in the box and in the water. And I love this story because it's so inspiring. So take it away, Calvin. <laughs> sure. So I had the great opportunity of uh, being cast for a show on the Discovery Channel called One Man Army. Michael Hawk, the host and creator of Man, Woman, Wild, was the host of this show. And basically it was four guys that went against each other in three events and uh, you had to pass each event until the last man was standing. And so uh, I was called out to California to be a part of this amazing show. And this was back in 2011. And um, the, the way I came about the show was that I was on Craigslist looking for work. And, uh, <laughs> Gotta love there, Craigslist. <laughs> you know, Craigslist. It, was, it, was, it was crazy. And I was looking for work all over the world. So I wound up uh, looking at the UK, at the TV programming and stuff like that. And there was this big, huge ad for this show that's coming up that was going to pit uh, military people against other military people in this last man standing kind of game. I was like, oh, sure, well, I'll just send in my information. I immediately 
got um, uh, was contacted back when I sent out the email and found out they were in California, Burbank, California. And uh, they told me the premise of the story. And that was back in 2010, toward the end of 2000, November 2010. And after signing my life away and signing all types of paperwork <laughs> and things like that. Soul uh, sucked. He got soul he sucked got in soul a different sucked. way. Yeah, well. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I get a call in April of 2011. They said, hey, Calvin, someone bowed out. Uh, can you fill in for this person and come out and do the shoot? I was like, yeah, sure, why not? So up until that time, I didn't really understand what was at, at risk uh, or what I was going to be <laughs> Probably going Probably good for. for you to not know. Yeah, it was. It was actually <laughs> it was very fortuitous that I didn't know. Uh, so I get there and uh, Monday and they pick us up and they take us to the hotel. And then um, over the next couple of days, they're doing a lot of filming and things like that. And then Wednesday we start. And so... During the filming process, they're asking, what are you scared of? What are you worried about? What are you concerned about? And I'm thinking, mm, <laughs> Be careful how you answer that. There's something fishy about this. Uh, so I mentioned that I was concerned about water, um, that I don't swim so well, and just don't put me in water kind of thing. Unbeknownst to them, I was when I was in the military, I was dive Come certified. on, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've certified. So uh, they wound up setting up a program for me and the three other guys that we would have to be in a plexiglass coffin, three by nine, filled with 50 degree water. And at one end was a blowhole. At the other end was bars that they would give you a hacksaw to be able to saw through. Calvin, I have to stop you for a second. Lou's face, <laughs> you can't see Lou. Lou's face just dropped. Like, see, ugh. See, this is where a little threat generation comes in handy because His I would have been onto was this. priceless. Oh, my God. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, but I just had to share the visual. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Because when they came home, and because so, what happened was that we would stay in this van and we would just hang out together and they would build these things while we were just hanging out. So each day they built a new uh, obstacle that we had to face. So that, uh, when they they told us that we were gonna do that, we were like, what did you say that we're gonna do? It was just crazy. And then I was the last person to go through it and I kept trying to figure out why these guys were, what was going on. I've tried to, and I, and I can't go into detail completely because you have to watch the show. Uh, I don't wanna give away too much, uh, but let's just say, that it was it wasn't what any of us expected let's just say that uh and then after that what happens is is that if you wind up losing that event they send you home and they were serious whoever lost that event was sent home and then the next uh phase we had to do is that we had to go over five eight foot fences go under and over five eight foot fences with an 80 pound backpack uh with us that we had to carry with us now it would have been great if there wasn't things blowing up around you, but there were things blowing up around you while you're doing this as well. So that was that was interesting too. And then the last um, obstacle was that they hang you upside down. You have five uh, safes that you have to figure out with clues how to break into. There are gun pieces in each of the safes. You put together Smith & Wesson, you load it up, you uh, shoot the rope and set yourself free. And that was the last thing that we had to figure out how to do. Uh, and so to watch the show, it's uh, one man army fear is not an option. So you can look it up. It's fantastic. Uh, and find that episode. episode. We, I, won't, I won't blow it for everybody. But if you're so inclined to have a little time today or over the weekend to watch, because I'll, I'll give it away next week. I'll tell everyone how it ends. But okay. if you can guess and imagine, it might end well for Calvin. No, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's but those kinds of things are, you know, people just don't throw themselves into. It's so exciting. And this is why being a human baton for the human baton is um, a great match for Calvin. Um, because he, you know, he came out to Texas and we did the UTV desert <laughs> Very windy, cold. Cold and windy. Very cold <laughs> um, and windy. Yes. Very fast little cars that drove around. And he was with J.C. Chappelle, who mm -hmm. I talked about um, a couple weeks ago to, that will eventually be on as well. Um, and they had a great time. So so comparatively, in all the things you've done, Calvin, what was that experience like? Because those are fast and crazy and there's mud and there's 
clay flying everywhere because I was covered in it, I know, <laughs> by Calvin and JC, particularly as they flew by me. <laughs> um, so how does that experience, you know, rate up there in terms of your adventure? So, so number one, it was an honor to be there in Texas and to, to meet you and the rest of the crew. It was just phenomenal. I had a great time. Thank you. Uh, and then how that rated, it's also up there with my Discovery Channel time because I had never done anything like that before. Uh, and it was something new. It was different. It was fast. It was fun. We were at a track and we were just flying, flying, especially over uh, bumps and jumps and stuff like that. It was just it was great. And I think what I liked the most about it was the team element uh, in riding with JC and being his navigator in that because there were some special things that we needed to do. And I need to make sure that we knew how many laps we were going around when we had to go on our detour. So that way we wouldn't have been disqualified. And it was just an amazing experience for me um, just because I had never done anything like that before. And, and so what would have made you do something like that just because like is it just because of that adventure spirit you have that you just go and just say oh yeah i'm gonna just do it or do you just seek out things like this or so what's interesting about this is that i wound up hearing about the human baton via a linkedin connection with uh some of the producers and stuff like that of the human baton and when i saw the link and the information about the human baton i was like that's me that all those things that they're doing with the different types of racing and the athletes and stuff like that, that's like the epitome of what I want to do and become and do and see and be a part of. And so when I saw that, I was like, I got to be a part of that. And so for a whole year, I'm going to say this, I was a stalker. I yep, stalked them. You the were. <laughs> I just kept talking with them, asking pinging. what's going on. He kept pinging us, ping ping hey i'm still here i'm still here exactly i just kept talking <laughs> with them talking with them constantly every month for uh but almost about a year yeah and then they they finally got back in touch with me and said hey calvin here's an opportunity to be able to come out see what you can do and then go from there and so when I, the opportunity came up for me to come out i started training immediately and that's the thing because when given the opportunity and i hear the yes then I get prepared because this is what I'm all about. Ever since that time in the Air Force where the opportunity was given to me and I said, no, this was an opportunity that I said, I want the yes. And when I get the yes, I'm going to be ready for it. So what did you have to do, you know, to train? Like, what did you do to train? Because I know what it goes, what we, you know, plan, you know, Eric Plackow is the, you know, the BAM, you know, the baton athlete manager. I'm the performance readiness advisor to the show um, or to the experience. And what is it that you did specifically to get yourself mentally and physically ready for winging around that course? So what, what, what happens for me is that I get in this mindset of like, uh, I want to be the best athlete possible for whatever event that I need to do. So I have a training regimen uh, since I'm a fitness and wellness coach and trainer that I use Russian kettlebells. Russian kettlebells to me are probably one of the most dynamic exercises that I can do. And I do it in a very heavy way. I, my, my heaviest kettlebell is 106 pounds. So I'm doing different touch, different kinds of exercise with that that increase my strength and conditioning, my flexibility, as well as my cardio. And so all of those create the perfect package for me as far as an athlete is concerned to be ready that whatever it is that I need to do for that sport, that I, my core is strong. And when my core is strong, my mind is set and in tune. And I know when my body is, in, is set in tune that I'm ready to face whatever uh, obstacle that I'm going to be dealing with. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a complete package that I do that I'm training hard for like, five or six days, and then I give my body a, a break. Uh, and I did that for a few weeks because I have a maintenance program that I do. And then whenever I'm getting ready to do some sort of sport or adventure, I ramp it up for uh, a few weeks before the actual event. So you stay in a maintenance mode of, of keeping yourself physically fit, and then you also stay in obviously yes. good mental fitness. It sounds like almost all of the time, because we are, all, you know, 99% of the time, it sounds like in every time I talk to you, you're right there mentally in terms of being on and focused and concentrating and disciplined and, and excited and positive and all those things. So um, do you think that they those two factors, physical and mental, complement each other in terms of taking adventures? Or do you think one is more important than the other? Or do you how do you see that? 
what I see the most is the is the internal um, mental fortitude that is necessary for competing. That is extremely, extremely important because I know athletes that may have all the conditioning, the strength and things like that. But if their mindset is not there, they can't accomplish and go out and do what they know that they're possible that they could possibly do. That's extremely important to me as far as the mindset, getting my mind focused on the task, making sure that I understand what it's going to take to win and then getting it done. Once I have that mental idea and understanding of what I need to do, then I notice that my body falls in line with where I'm pointing my mind to go. And so uh, with that, the intensity is there, the seeing that I want to win and that's what I'm going for. I'm not looking for second or third place. I'm looking to win. And then when that, that, when I have that locked in, it's like a mission. That's what I call it. That's what I learned in survival school. The, the mission is, is that if I'm behind enemy lines then I'm going to get across enemy lines and survive and get to where I need to get to. If I need to help somebody um, overcome an obstacle, I'm going to help them do that. Whatever the mission is, it's got to be accomplished. And my mindset is there. And that, so that way, when my mindset is there, my body follows. So you have the mind gym and the physical gym. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to term that. So, and that, and that's what I, you know, Calvin, you've seen the show now and we've talked a lot now that, um, trying to impart to so many people that want like an adventure and want to be successful at it, but that you have to have the physical piece, which if you train your body, that comes naturally automatically over and over, as long as you keep in that maintenance mode. And then the mind gym piece of it, keeping your gym in your head all the time in terms of focus, being positive, productive, staying away from soul suckers or joy suckers, um, people that don't want to go right. on the adventure. People don't have to do it with you, right? But they, you need to have people around you that aren't saying, you know, while you're, you know, you're eating, you know, your chicken and your broccoli that people are eating hot fudge sundaes. <laughs> <laughs> Saying here, why don't you have one of those, right? All the time, right? Um, it's like it's the crab in the bucket analogy. You know, there's always if you guys have ever seen crabs in a bucket, the crabs are all down at the bottom, and there's one always trying to get up and out. That's we'll call that our Calvin today. Yep. He's getting up and out, up and out. But what are what are all the other crabs doing? They're underneath pulling you back down, pulling, 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 and um, so it's really hard. But when you have that mind gym going, and you have the physical gym that crab makes it out of the bucket. So, so Calvin is sort of the crab getting out of the bucket. Sorry, Calvin. No, <laughs> You're the crab getting out of the bucket. So it's a perfect blend of um, the, you know, the physical and mental uh, strength and flexibility that has to happen to become an athlete like that. And then in life in general, um, Lou and I often talk about Calvin that, um, you know, anything you do for sports psychology, like I do, and, and clinical work like that, is that um, it li- it's a lifelong process anyway. It doesn't have to be just about sports. It's crossover into everything and anything. So so Calvin being a human baton in training, um, he also has all these other aspects of his life. So he, he's a fitness and wellness trainer. He um, helps with a sanctuary for veterans and their families. He and his friend have an equine therapy program. Nice. Um, And then he also puts his efforts into um, working with helping with the human trafficking issue here in, I would assume here and abroad, right? Not just, I would, maybe. Supporting organizations that fight against human trafficking, yes, most definitely. There's Polaris and then there's the International Justice Mission that does amazing work with governments all over the world for stopping human trafficking. Polaris is local here in the United States to help local uh, in our country, which is terrible human trafficking, but those two I support. Excellent. So, um, so this is like to the viewers and the listeners is that, you know, having your mindset and your physical body set every day to, you don't necessarily have to be working on human trafficking issues, but it's more about like, how are you making your, you know, your footprint in the world on a daily basis? Is it just, you know, again, not having to run a marathon like Calvin and I might, but, but taking those little steps every day of like, how did you make the day better for yourself? How did you make the day better for someone else um, by doing all these different things or, or being someone that puts out um, a program like Calvin's doing to inspire youth. So you work with in your uh, health and fitness programming. So it's, I'm going to make sure I get this right. It's Exodus Adventures, correct? 
Exodus Adventures. Yep. And and you do is that youth only or is that youth and adults that you do that with? It is youth and adults. Back in the day, I believe that people want a departure from the ordinary things of life and they want to live a life of adventure. Hence Exodus Adventures. And uh, the way I wanted to differentiate myself with Exodus, was, it was out the E and it starts with an X. Because back in the day, the X was where it was at. You find your, you find your, uh, the the treasure. You find whenever there's a map, there's an X that marks the spot. That is where you find the answer uh, to a lot of the questions. Whenever you're going off in an adventure and you're seeking for something, X always marked the spot. So that's why Exodus Adventures came into being and I wanted to work with young people to inspire them to continue to not uh, to continue after their dreams and goals because somewhere down the line as we grow up w however it happens maybe because of adulting whatever but somewhere dreams and goals wind up being pushed cast aside and the responsibilities of being an adult overshadow those things that um, inspire us to be able to go out and do what we were created to do so I wanted to remind you that I was in their shoes at one time as well. And there were times where I almost gave up on the things that I wanted to go after. Uh, and that if I can do it, um, and as many obstacles as I've had to go through, and as many things I've had to face, that if I can do it, that they can do it too, and that I can encourage and support them as well. I don't only want to just be the crab that comes out of the pot by myself, <laughs> but be able to grab some other crabs that want to get out as well. And so that's the that's the goal for why I, I love doing what I do. And and so how long have you been doing the, uh, you know, officially your ExodusAdventures.com, by the way, in case Ooh. people want to look you up? I've been doing that since 2004. So I've been doing that for quite a while now. Uh, and uh, how I give back to the youth is that uh, in my community, uh, I substitute teach. And so a lot of the kids I've seen growing up, they call me Coach K. And so the goal is, is that Coach K is here to support. He's tough and he's fair. And he, and he wants to encourage me to go out and be the best that I can be. It's fantastic. See, we, all, we need a Calvin. We all have to be a little Calvin in this. Yes. Okay so, and, and then that, okay, so we have that piece, which is super cool. And then I love this because, you know, I work with veterans. I do a lot of work with PTSD and addictions counseling for veterans and returning veterans and people who are still active duty. And Calvin provides... Um, uh, part of the uh, Project Sanctuary, um, and it's out in Colorado. And mm -hmm. so for veterans that are listening today, here's another thing that if you're looking for something to be involved in, Calvin has this as well. So give us a little bit about Project Sanctuary and, and anything you want to tell us about it. Sure. So just to back up a little bit, my dad was a Vietnam vet, and so I have a lot of respect for our veterans that were in Vietnam as well as other wars as well. And so uh, he got out in 1972, 1973, and then he wasn't diagnosed with PTSD until 2004. And so that stuck with me uh, in my life. And because of that, uh, and my time in the military, I and the transition and the difficulty of coming out of the military and going into civilian life, <clears throat> Uh, I wanted to give back. I wanted to support our military members and our veterans and their families. Uh, and so I joined an organization called Project Sanctuary uh, that's been around for like the last 13 to 14 years. Uh, a lady by the name of Heather Ely, uh, a nurse, saw that a lot of the veterans were getting support, but their families also needed support as well. And so what she wanted to do was create a retreat to be able to bring military members and their families together so that way they could bond, get support, and get the needed help that they needed to be able to come back together uh, and move forward as a, as, a, as a cohesive unit. And so what we do is that we do six-day therapeutic retreats uh, for military members and their families. And the headquarters is in Colorado, but we also have retreats in Maryland, in North Carolina, in Georgia, in Kentucky, uh, in Texas, in California, uh, and so I've traveled all over running these retreats and I manage the staff and the volunteers to be able to support our families. Uh, before the pandemic, we averaged about eight to 12 families and their kids. Um, we had funders and sponsors that would pay for them to come to these retreats. They just had to figure out how to get there and how to get home. Uh, and then we would offer activities from um, whitewater rafting to hiking to 
uh, you name it. We had all types of fun things that they did. And then in the midst of those times, we would have classes on how to have better communication as a family and as a couples. We talked about the importance of finances, how to support themselves in regards to how to invest their money and make their money work for them. Uh, and we also talked about PTSD, which yes. is post-traumatic growth now instead of right. distress. Uh, and so we wanted to offer tools for them to be able to bring them together and support them as a family unit. Uh, and I've been working with them since uh, April of 2017. And I love this organization. Uh, I serve them uh, each month for about a week where I'm either here in Colorado or I'm somewhere else in the United States running these retreats. I love it. It's probably one we of the need most. To get one here in Massachusetts. Yeah, definitely. Why don't we have one here, Calvin? <laughs> no That's pressure. That's a great question. Because we that should have question. one here in a big way. I mean, and not for nothing. I mean, yep. I might, I might know some people. <laughs> yeah, we got plenty of stuff to do out here too. I know. So, Calvin. Okay, that's a sidebar, not on the show day, but we're gonna have to have a separate conversation about that, right? Um, I just, great. I just think that that's a great, um, what a great opportunity. You know, you know, you talk about really diversifying your life. Again, I talk about this on the show all the time is, you know, don't be unidimensional. This is another fleshed out piece of the puzzle of how to, you know, your life isn't stagnant. You have all these different pieces. You know, if you're if this isn't going on, you know, certain day, well, you've got, you know, Project Sanctuary. You've got, um, the, oh, and oh, let me add in one more piece. You ready? Yes. He has equine therapy, too. So, <laughs> so Operation Equine, right? It's Operation Equine. Operation Equine, operationequine.org. My partner, uh, my friend and founder of Operation Equine does equine assisted therapy for military members and first responders. Uh, she is a phenomenal uh, therapist and is helping to uh, use equine therapy to be able to help break through the issues that surround uh, communication and uh, emotional issues that need to be worked through. Uh, it's one of the most amazing things with using equine assisted therapy uh, because horses don't lie. And it's something else with working with a, a, a thousand pound animal uh, to be able to get them to trust you. Uh, you can't play games. You can't act fake. You, you've got to be real and authentic. And that's what I really appreciate uh, with equine assisted therapy. And so, well, OK, so this is. I got a little bit of a tie into the human baton that I'm going to talk about here in a second, but that's right. So, horses. right. The yeah. horses. But so here, here in Massachusetts, we actually have multiple programs and I, and I do consulting for them. And, and in terms of, he says equine, I say equine, you know, potato, potato, it's all the same. <laughs> it's, horses. it's horses. Um, but it's, it's allowing, you know, so Ironstone farm that's right down the yeah. street from us here. Yeah. Um, you know, they have a great program for veterans either to become volunteers there or to get, you know, therapeutic services there. Um, and everything's therapeutic, even if you're just going there to muck a stall, but it's about being able to be around the horses and connect and how important um, to realize that horses are super smart. They're cognitive, you know, they're sentient beings. They have a way of communicating. They know you right off the bat. They will re remember you forever through their nose flares if yep. you didn't know that that's what they do um there's there's so much amazing connection that you can have and you can teach interpersonal connection for people who struggle with that and and whether you're a veteran or not um you, a, anyone and everyone you know could benefit from that i'm highly allergic to horses just like <laughs> i am to cats that's why I, owe I own five of them <laughs> and i have no problem being around horses because i'd rather have my face blow up and look terrible than to not be around them so you right. know it's one of those sacrifices i will make to be able to connect with a horse um but that being said uh one of the legs of our of our our race is um, an endurance part of it with horses, and um, and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about your program, Calvin. But uh, you haven't done the endurance part of it as a human baton yet with the horses. How do you feel about doing that? Not yet, and again, the adventure. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing how that all is going to play out. Have I ridden a horse for? Uh, a mile, let alone lots of miles, no. However, I will make sure to have my mind focused and my body prepared for when that opportunity presents itself because I have uh, a special person in my life that can help me to get the training that I need for the horse portion of the human baton, which I'm extremely excited about as well. I think that there has to be 
a lot of squats and yeah. abductor and adductor training on these things. I'm just saying. I would have to say correct. To be able to put your tush on a horse and not, you know, how it feels if you haven't been on a horse in a while and then you get on and the next day you can't walk. Well, right. imagine going, <laughs> just do a couple dozen miles on a horse for, you know, across the desert or across, you know, really. Yeah, but what does anti-chafing training look like? <laughs> That's got to be the big there is, impediment, isn't well, it? Well, I have to tell you, there's a fantastic product made for marathoners called Chafex. And you just slather it down the inside of your legs and you're fine. <laughs> so, Calvin, when you get ready to ride the endurance... I'll give you the Chafex. It will be fine. I appreciate that. I was also thinking about the chappies, too. You know, riding down with, on the pants and putting those and possibly having some special padding and stuff. I'll be, I was thinking about that as well. I want to make sure I'm prepared. And that's another thing. Always make sure you're prepared. Don't go in there half, uh, half prepared. Make sure that you are prepared. That is something that I learned in my many, many adventures. So so now here's the thing, even so if, if someone's not being a human baton and they're just wanting to be involved in like riding horses um, and making themselves feel good, you know, there is a preparedness piece to it. And that's just maybe just in part familiarizing yourself with the relationship to the horse, because not only physically, I mean, I've seen people get up on a horse and go off the other side and that's the end of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but really having the physicality, if you're gonna do this even just for fun, you know, just right. having that piece and then also being mentally connected. It's not just you. And this is the difference. And I and I've been talking to other batons in training as well as Calvin about when you're when you're doing a rally car, a drift car, uh, jumping out of a plane, uh, you're doing those things on your own. You're under the control of you. You have the control right. of the vehicle, you're co-piloting, whatever you're doing, but it's you. Now you enter a horse. Mm -hmm. A horse has its own mind, its own right. thought, its own feelings, its own behavior. And just like a relationship, a marriage, um, friendships, right. if you don't have that connection, it's not going to perform for you and you're not going to perform for it. it. You have to like each other. You have to fall in love with each other at times. You have to really right. have that there for that to give you uh, the best um, relationship. So if you're not going to be a human baton, that's fine. But in terms of like what you're doing with... Um, the equine or the equine mm -hmm. operation. Um, it's just about building a connection, a relationship. So uh, for my listeners out there, if, if they're looking for something to do in the pandemic, there are places around the country, including here in Massachusetts and where Calvin was just saying all over the country as well, that you can go and you can, during this time, arrange to spend time with a horse, to build a relationship because it's soothing. And just like animal therapy, as you know, Lou, I, I do animal assisted yep. therapy with horses, dogs, cats, etc. Um, the lowering of your blood pressure, the release mm -hmm. of cortisol for diabetes, the um, being able to relieve stress, um, depression lifts. I mean, there's so many benefits to doing animal interaction experiences and horses give such a benefit to that. So not only is it awesome to do that for the human baton, but also just for people to do in their daily lives. And people don't think of it as that. They think I have to either be like an equestrian, you know, extraordinaire or <laughs> not. And it's not that. You could just go and just be. You could walk by the walk beside the horse and touch the horse and get to know the horse and it's an amazing experience. And it's super important for veterans. Um, because we know that um, these types of therapies, um, just having the exposure gives uh, a huge relief to the PTSG, the growth process, to get them away from the hypervigilance piece and away from the anxiety and the fight or flight. And so just that piece. But bring it back to Calvin for a second. I had to do that because I want to make sure it was <laughs> applicable to the world. Yeah. Um, uh, Calvin, so what about the human baton? Any of the events scares you? Just a little bit. Come on, anything? He's going to say no. Gonna <laughs> I don't know no. about the, it's so much scaring me. I think the most, uh, I think the one that gives me pause is the Thundercat because of how you're supposed to be situated in the boat. So that way, uh, when you're hitting around those corners really fast, you got to make sure that you're leaning. Uh, and being able to counterbalance and stuff like that. I, I, I'm looking forward to getting on the Thundercat. Uh, I've always wanted to do uh, skydiving. The rally cars are so much fun. The UTVs are so much fun. Uh, the horse riding, uh, I'll probably be shaped pretty well, but I'll, I love animals and I love horses. 
Uh, I think the the interesting thing for me for the whole event for the Human Baton is the transition part, going from one activity to the next activity to the following activity of going from point A to point B in one day, and then the next day going from B to A. That's that's what I'm thinking about mostly as far as uh, the preparations, the transitions, uh, how uh, the preparation for all of that, the mindset. Uh, how to be able to transition for each sport and what I need to focus on and how to best support the team as well as my horse that I'll be working with and building that relationship to be able to win because that's the goal, right, to win as an athlete. What's the level of preview when you transition events? In other words, when you go in a rally car, is it the first time you sit in a rally car, the first time you compete? Oh, you get a you get a little taste of it before him. So, so well for, in Calvin's, and I'll speak to this for a second. So, in in Calvin's condition that he came in, he had just come in and had a little bit of training in the in the um, UTV a little bit before the actual race. So he had all the safety training, and he you know told what to do and how to do it. And JC helped him, you know, because JC was his driver and and was able to explain. They were in and they did some trial runs and then back and forth. So typically, there's more um, lead up time for training of those things. But in the condition that we were in, and given that we're in the pandemic, we had to we've been shortening some of these things up because we have to for time's right. sake right now. But um, Calvin had some training in it and some experience to be able to go into it, and then. And then we just throw them in. <laughs> <laughs> just went right on in there, right, Calvin? Just go ahead and just go for it. And that's what I love that kind of stuff because uh, you're on an even playing field and the person that's able to adjust and be okay with the mindset and have the conditioning is the one that's going to have the most fun, at least for me. I mean, I had a blast. I had a great time. And it also helped that JC is a complete badass. I mean, he can drive <laughs> the heck out of UTV. Let me tell you something. It was it was pretty impressive. So JC JC's a fantastic um, driver, and he has yes. lots of accolades and merited under his belt for being a uh, multiple different vehicle type of driver. So it's not just UTVs, but he also is the um, owner and creator or joint creator of Lap King, which is an online right. app for. Um, basically doing online uh, gaming for laps and racing. So, mm -hmm. um, so he has quite the experience. So in, in the human baton, um, m much of the time, the human baton themselves is the co-pilot is the, you know, is the driver's already got the experience and the co-pilot or the human baton comes in and is making sure that all the navigation is correct. So you have to be in really good physical condition. So that's the most important thing is coming in with the physical training piece, even if you haven't been in the vehicle or on the horse or out of the plane, that your body's ready because there's certain training. So we offer training on on our platform, um, and um, it, which you can go to, which is THB dot live um, and you can go to the website thb.rocks and we offer the training Eric Plackow and the BAM team myself we all are helping people get physically and mentally ready so that they can show up if they want to come to a grassroots event say here in Massachusetts or out in Colorado and we're gonna you know hey we're bringing the, the Thundercats out um, there's drivers already ready for the boat and then you get the human baton in and then we teach them how to navigate how to how to move your body around the boat yeah I'm um, learning today they're a bigger contributor to it I I was thinking in terms of just passenger between these racing no. platforms, but a participant, more of a participant. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So it's it's you. It's a partnership in in each of the different events to be able to really know your your partner, each other, mm -hmm. so that you can be the best team together to win, as Calvin right. says, because the goal is to win. <laughs> Have you told him about the water coffin segment yet? <laughs> um, well, I think that everyone should go and watch uh, uh, Kelvin on uh, the Discovery Channel show One Man Army, and it's the second episode, and uh, definitely do that. And um, certainly as we get ready to wrap up the show, um, I wanted to give uh, any last words before I give all your different places to go and see you and find you and all right. Did you have Calvin? I would love to say more and talk more, but we have to end. But did you have anything else that you wanted to add and give to the audience today about like how to go out there and get it and and bring it on home? Yes, I do. <clears throat> the most important thing that I've realized over my uh, lifetime, as far as adventures and mindset and things like that, 
It always starts with a choice. We all have a choice. The most important aspect of the gift that we've been given as, as humankind are choices. We have a choice to either participate or not participate. And hopefully my story and my life can encourage someone else that's out there that's listening, that's trying to figure out what to do differently, how, um, how to move forward, how to have encouragement, how to just have a change. It just starts with a choice. And, and, to, and to be quite honest, it's an easy one if you really think about it. Just do it. Make sure to do it. Get it done. Make that choice. Even though uh, the fear of difficulty sometimes inhibits us from moving forward, if you put it in its perspective, fear is a healthy thing. It's not used to control. Allow it to be there as far as tempering, but not to keep you from going after dreams and goals. Wow. That was lovely, wasn't nice it? Nice finish. I yeah. know, I know. All right, so Calvin, that was beautifully said. You must, you, you must be channeling uh, my mind because we talk about the choice, and you know, it's, it's a choice to do things that are hard, and it's a choice to not do things that are hard, and it's your choice, and it's what you said was eloquently spoken. So, all right. So, if you want to find Calvin Evans and you want to contact him, or you want to see anything else he's up to and doing, um, and certainly we will probably have him back because we loved having you. I loved having yeah, you. Yeah, um, ExodusAdventures.com. Um, you can also find him on Instagram.com backslash Calvin J. Evans Fitness. Um, he's on uh, Facebook at, Advent at Exodus Adventures. Um, if you want to get to his Project Sanctuary, it's uh, projectsanctuary.us. His equine, equine, <laughs> whichever way you'd like to pronounce it. Assisted therapy is operationequine.org. Um, and then you can find out more information on his Polaris Project by going to polarisproject.org or the International Justice Mission for Human Trafficking, um, which is www.ijm.org. And those are all of Calvin's pieces, but certainly you can find him out there. I know if you do a quick search on him, he pops up and now he's part of the human baton. <laughs> and, um, and we can't tell you all the things about all the outcomes yet because, you know. It's, yeah. you, you can't, I can't tell you how it ends. Right. So, but if you watch him on One Man Army next week, if you don't watch it, I'm telling you how it ends. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely part of my weekend viewing this I week. Know. <laughs> um, so, Calvin, it was so great. You're so inspiring. And uh, my goal of this show is to inspire health and wellness and change and motivation in people by making good choices. And every day is a choice. And I couldn't have said it better myself. And you said it. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go off air here in a second when I say goodbye, but don't leave. All right. Roger that. All right. <laughs> and Lou. Yes. I'm coming Great stalking show. the snowy owl this weekend. All right. All right. I'll try <laughs> to latch one up for you. I'm coming to your house. <laughs> Stand on the back stoop all right thank you for this it was a great show and um anybody has any questions certainly contact me have a great week you guys and i will see you next week <laughs>